Welcome along to episode 9 of the Escapade show And we have a very, very <coughs> special guest today Sanjeev Kali. hello Sanjeev How you doing? Yes, great, thank you, Fantastic. how are you? I'm grand, I'm good I was going to say it's a pleasure to be here, but I'll reserve judgment because it feels slightly like a, so hot, a hostage situation. <laughs> I feel you've just been telling me there wasn't a wall there before, and now you've bricked it up. Yeah, yes. it's been so, bricked up. You don't want to know what's behind well, it. Well, it, well, it might be me next. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know. We'll get the podcast done first. Good, that, do it in that order, because I'm in <laughs> use as a corpse, getting nothing <laughs> from me. <laughs> so we've commandeered uh, Sanjeev in today who is uh, famously known throughout Scotland and, and even England now as well. Um, and but, since we've been on Netflix, Vietnam apparently. Yeah. Vietnam, so it's still game in Vietnam? Or? Apparently, apparently. It's, uh, I don't know what they call right it there, but apparently the, the, it's it's weird though. I mean, it's been on Netflix now, so we don't know the exact breakdown of numbers, but Ford, who to be fair is an inveterate liar, but he has said that he's had received <laughs> messages from Vietnam saying that it's making waves there, so... I'll take that to the bank. Excellent. So I'm guessing, obviously, subtitles. I don't, well, I don't know. I'd, I'd like to think that they're learning the lingo. Okay. <laughs> well, Hopefully, my, I'd like to think as well. Well, well my, when I was growing up, because I grew up in, in Glasgow and um, uh, I had cousins in India, and my dad would insist, we, we went over for three big family holidays, and my dad insisted that we took stuff to India to, to give to my cousins, and he made us take our Bruins and Orwali annuals. So we took these to India. Right. <laughs> and we and, and we never got them back, so I'd like to think that they they got circulated, they circulated and, ended, and there'll be someone from my family will end up in the, in, the, in in government and saying James Cribbins helped my bob. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So who, who knows that exactly could be happening in Vietnam right now? Wow, wow! So you have touched loads of corners of the globe, and uh, I mean it's 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 actually it must be pretty crazy being involved in something like Still Game because we we're kind of talking, you know, before it. It's like you've done so much other work. But it's one of those ones, it's just like people are crazy for still game. Well, it still surprises me pleasantly always that the, it's actually the demographic surprises me. You'll get four-year-olds and 90-year-olds, men and women. Mm -hmm. Last time I went to Teen the Park, there was some band, I can't remember who they were, all skinny and hair over their eyes, and they're wanting pictures. And you, th it's, you don't want to analyse it too much because yeah. you like it, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like, don't look a gift off in the mouth, it might dissolve in front of your eyes, but... Um, it's very gratifying that it seems to connect with, with people of... It surprises me, the, the, the sheer kind of variety of people that seem to be into the show. And it isn't just a Scottish thing anymore. I mean, no. people say that it's, um, oh, that's your Glasgow humour, that's your West of Scotland humour, that's your Scottish humour. I think, yeah, strands of it, I think, are Scottish humour. Like, for example, whenever the boys come into the pub and, you know, and Bobby says something and they one-up him, I mean, that's very, very Scottish. Mm -hmm. That's like... I can I can one up you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the whole, all those self deprecating thing. That's a very Scottish trait. But then there's other stuff which is universal. Absolutely. You know. So I think yeah, bits of it are Scottish. But it if if it was just a Scottish comedy, it would work out beyond Hadrian's Wall, and and it does. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's the it's the essence of the storytelling, yes. really, isn't it? And and those stories relate to anyone of, of any age, and I guess it's why it done so well. So, well, I guess it's probably a good way to, to kind of kick things <coughs> off. How did you even get involved in it and and get the part of Navid, who is definitely most most people's favourite character in the show, or if not, there or thereabouts? Which is why I've his look. Yeah. Um, I um, used to write for Chewing the Fat. I mean, basically, I'll take it back. You, you'll be old enough to remember Chewing the Fat. Yeah, I love Chewing the Fat. Well, it actually started as a radio show on Radio Scotland. It was quite a different show back then. Uh, and I got drafted in to produce it. At that time, I, I, I was writing a bit of comedy and I was still working in radio. That's where I started as a radio presenter. Oh, yeah. And um, so I got drafted in as a, a producer and then... <clears throat> it went to telly and then I became a writer on the show. So I, I used to write The Lonely Shopkeeper, so I've always been obsessed with shops. Uh, I used to write the two guys, we call them the Dixons boys, the, the two guys that always try to sell guarantees. I wrote that Sports Socks, uh, Sports Socks, they Sports Socks, two for yeah, pound, yeah. I wrote that one, <laughs> uh, based on the guy that sold Sports Socks in Argyle Street in Glasgow. Um, and at that time, I, th I can't remember, we were maybe four or five series in, and Ford approached me and he said that... Uh, we all stayed quite near each other and there was a, a shop, a convenience store run by an Asian family. And he wanted to base a character on the guy that ran it. And Ford was going to play him. The thing is about Ford is he's, he's brilliant at accents. And he can do a very good Glasgow Italian and a very good Glasgow Asian accent. And he said, do you think it'll be an issue? 
you know, I mean, if, if a white guy plays an Asian, I said, no, it's all about authenticity. If you get it right, and by the sounds of it, you are getting it right, then it's not a problem. If you need me to give you a steer, like mm -hmm. culturally, just things yeah. here and there, then I'm happy to do that. And then that just kind of went away, it never happened. And then Still Game came around. And now, there was obviously, well, I say obviously, it's not that obvious, but there were a few candidates for what would be spun off from Chewing the Fat. There was talk of the teacher, remember the teacher that Camden Bar played? Yes. Oh, there was talk of her getting her own sitcom. <laughs> yeah. And I actually co-wrote a pilot for that. It never came to anything. Purple crayons, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you you can come back to this class when your face is the same <laughs> colour as your <laughs> neck. <laughs> uh, and I, in fact, I did, I wrote with my mate Donnie, who I write with, we, we wrote a pilot where she lived with her dad and had been that way because she got jilted at the altar and it's kind of stayed as that woman and, and then uh, uh, all her life and she was just kind of failed the bless her this kind of failed human being who mm -hmm. got to teaching that came to nothing there was talk of Ronald Villiers the actor mm -hmm. getting his own sitcom but that came to nothing but it more and more it came back to the Jack and Victor because that had already been a stage play so they had a history already before during the fact yeah. so then still game happened and then Ford and Greg approached me again they talked about the shopkeeper character and I said well my offer still stands if you need a hand you know a guiding hand and yeah, yeah. He said, no, do you want to play him? I said, aye. <laughs> uh, and, and Greg had always liked it when I impersonated my dad. Um, uh, and uh, so I said, I, I still auditioned for it, but um, I, I basically kind of did my dad, but with a governor accent. So yeah. Because, I mean, I um, I grew up in Glasgow and I went to Langside College and that's in the south side of Glasgow and it's quite a big Asian um, area. So, I mean, I, I used to go... To, to college at eight and junior with these guys at eight thought like this and I knew a guy called Saeed at eight and he looked like he was 12 years old at eight and he used to, he used to be saying to me since you were eight see if anyone ever crosses me I'll break <laughs> I'll get cousins who'll break their legs and, and he was always at the stocks and shares um, strange guy but he, I, I was fascinated I used to love that uh, yeah. you know we when I where I grew up as well in Bishop Briggs we had <clears throat> I, I was actually born in London, so I've got quite an Anglify, and I had a middle class upbringing as well, so I'm quite kind of gentle, Glasgow, vaguely Anglified accent. But there was an Asian family stayed next door, the Panesas, and they'll feel like this, and I remember she, oh, she was giving this guy direction, hey, go left, right, and then you'll take the right, you'll take second right, and stay on the right. <laughs> and I just, it made me laugh, it's just, it's just naturally funny. So I knew I could do that mm -hmm. Govan Hill thing, so I kind of combined my dad because my dad talks like this, really quite sort of, a, he's a user teacher, so very articulate, he speaks like this. And then you put on the Glasgow thing, you know, and up in the quality, but that, and as well, and you bother. So, <laughs> um, I think, um, Excellent. I, in the midst of time, I can't remember exactly how it kind of evolved, but I think I said, well, why don't I just sort of play my dad? So let's have a beard and a turban. I come from a Sikh family, I'm the only guy that doesn't have a turban. Let's give him, a, you know, a, a beard turban, um, uh, the full gear uh, and that kind of helped me because I hadn't done a huge amount of acting at that point I was a writer turned actor so I probably wanted a few things to hide behind yeah. but then the the, the sixth the, the sixth episode in the first series the storyline is about me drink at a Muslim wedding right and I think the problem is I couldn't be a Sikh then because if you go to Sikh wedding it's like a brewery it's booze everywhere right. so you can't have that storyline you can't say me drink at a Sikh wedding that would be false yeah so, um, trust me, if you can get invited to seek wedding, mm -hmm. free booze. Cool. There's a bottle of Bacardi, a bottle of vodka, a bottle of gin at every table. Maybe Beer on one. tap. So try, try and work it out if you can. <laughs> try, try and go out with a girl called Manji if you possibly can. <laughs> and you can get divorced six months later, you'll have the night of your life. <laughs> uh, so, that was why he then became Naveed. But the beard and the tash stayed. Yeah. Which is great, though. I mean, I mean, I look at him, I see my dad. Uh -huh. I mean, there are certain things I do even. There was, a, you know, the story of Maduri. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm haggling with them at Selma Maduri, and I can't remember the exact. That's the other thing. People remember the dialogue better than I do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I know what that feels like because I obsess about other comedy. So Absolutely. It's, it's so gratifying when people obsess about the thing you're in because I do yeah. it with other people. So at one point, I'm haggling. I think it's 12 pound 13, 11, 12. And I agree, and I kind of do this, like this. That's my dad. Yeah. I didn't even know I'd done it. So um, that's kind of how I seen the beat. And that's how that all started. It was from, I, I guess Ford must have hung on to that character and thought, oh, we can put him in this scheme. We've got the boys, we've got Isa, we've got... So the original um, still game stage play was Jack, Victor and Winston. Mm -hmm. So they broadened the world and they obviously thought it'd be nice to have 
a pub and a shop. And uh, I, uh, I must admit, I was slightly nervous when the, when the show was starting to go out because I'm thinking, oh God, well, you know, they're going to think, oh God, and he's in a telly, he's a shopkeeper. Uh, yeah, yeah. Stereotype, right? But I actually think that it's worth celebrating because it is a stereotype because it's true. Yeah. And you have to analyse the reasons why so many Asian families run shops. <clears throat> you know, the, my dad, um, we had a shop for a while, two, three years uh, in Battlefield in Glasgow. And the reason we had a shop was that my dad was a qualified teacher and he taught for a while. My mum was a qualified social worker. And they watched all their friends getting promoted. They thought, stop this, we're mm-hmm. starting our own business. Yeah. And you know, my mum put the hours in, she'd go in six in the morning, leave six at night. and. So I think it celebrates the fact that we have a work ethic yes. and that we, are, you know, and, you know, my mum did that to send us to private school. I mean, I've always said, if you want to see the kind of the immigrant experience um, in a nutshell, go to the gates of a private school and you'll see a shop van dropping off the kids. And that, mm-hmm. tell, that to me tells a story of yeah, parents yeah. that work their arses off to give their kids a better future. Absolutely. So I think, why not celebrate that, you know? Yeah. So I'm happy with it. Plus, running your own business is a really positive thing as oh, well. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it's taking ownership of your own lives. So exactly, exactly. And if you see that the return you get on a chocolate tool is like point one pence, yeah. So you need to put the hours in. Yeah. yeah. That speaks to me of a work ethic. Uh, so I absolutely, and uh, you know, when it comes down to it, you know, I mean, again, David was written uh, as the he's the rich guy in the scheme. He's the guy that's driving the Merc with yeah. the, probably a private number plate. So yeah, 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 he's yeah. done all right. Yeah. So it's, it's it's something worth celebrating. Absolutely. No, definitely. Uh, absolute favourite character of mine, to be honest. Well, I think I think he offers something new. I mean, yeah. we probably all know. I mean, each of us have based our uh, characters on someone. So, um, And they've all talked about it. So Greg bases Victor on his granddad who lived in Maryhill. Ford based uh, Jack on his uncle Barney. Uh, Gav based Bobby on a guy that he'd worked with. I can't remember. It was a specific bar. Because he got that, the chain thing from yes. him as well. From okay. him. Um, uh, uh, Jane, I think it's an aunt of hers that she's based eyes on, and, and I'm not sure who Paul based Winston on. Um, Mark, <clears throat> who I think Tam actually is the most underrated character. I think Tam's amazing. Tam's great. Um, he based it on someone he knew. Uh, but I just think that actually, for a lot of people, Naveed's pro- possibly, oh, he's fictional, right? He's so well written that he feels real. So he ends up being the only Asian in people's lives. So it's something different. Yes. I think that's why it's like, I've not had that accent before. Yeah. So I think I'm quite lucky that I get to play someone that has that wee... That uniqueness. Yeah, yeah. I also loved Eric. Oh, Eric's like, great. Yeah. Because he genuinely was old. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you know, his power was yeah, yeah. phenomenal oh, throughout the series. He's a very interesting guy, Jimmy Martin, that plays Eric. Because um, he, he's been in the acting game for a while, but he was a firefighter. You know, back in there the day. There was actually an episode, and he says, I used to be in the fire brigade. Yeah. I'm going to say something. I, I've yeah. seen something. And that's, yeah. yeah. And that was, I was bless him, Jimmy's a lovely guy. Uh, um, he tells a good story, and you tell all these you know, stories about the, I mean, he was involved in a fire in cheap side street in Glasgow where like, lots of people died and stuff. And, uh, you know, back in those days when they didn't quite have the equipment they got these days. So, yeah, um, he's, he's uh, he had the life experience before he got into acting. And, mm-hmm. uh, He's a good guy, but yeah, it's um, it was harder for him coming back after what, what it was eight nine years. I mean, you know, we are a bit closer to our screen age now, but he was like beyond it. Yeah, um, he's in good shape though, so um, it was good. It was great that he could come back and, and, and do a turn. How did you find the the live shows went? God, uh, amazing. I mean, it was so we'd finished Still Game, uh, two thousand and seven or eight. Ford and Greg fell out. No more still game. And then I had a theory that would come back. I've got this 10-year theory about bands mostly. Mm-hmm. That what happens is is that usually with bands, like say for example Fleetwood Mac, um, you've got the bit where you're making no money but it's fun. Then you get that you go up the slope and you hit that sweet spot where you're making enough money and it's still fun. Then you get there where you're making lots of money, it's not fun anymore. Mm-hmm. Too much pressure, too many demands on you. Then you're up here where you're in different jets now, you can't even speak to each other. And yeah, yeah, you're making a, 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 I know this is happening to you guys, um, uh, where you're, um, you're making massive money, but you're just, your heart's not in it anymore and there's too many pressures and outside influences. Um, they split up and then the way the human mind works is you remember the good stuff after a while. Um, mm. I call it Starsky and Hutch, my Starsky and Hutch theory, which is, uh, you guys are too young to remember Starsky and Hutch, but it used to be a series before it was a film. 
And when I remember Starsky and Hutch, I remember the amazing title sequence. You sit and watch Starsky and Hutch, it's dull, but your brain remembers the good stuff. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I had a theory that it would come back. I never thought it would be a live show. I can still remember uh, Greg saying to me, oh, yeah, yeah, we're coming back and we're going to be at the Hydro. What? Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, they were, they were pretty much drawing them out there because as much as, um, I mean, it did work in the end, but they did not, they had no frame of reference for it because the closest thing you could, you could compare it to was Panto. Yeah. But Panto's never in front of more than two, three thousand people. Narrative comedy hadn't been done on a stage that size, I don't think, ever. Sketch shows, yes, Monty Python were doing a sketch show, and that was difficult enough. Yeah. But to actually carry 11,000 people with a story you know, over the course of two, two and a half hours, I don't think that had been done before on a stage that size. So, in a lot of ways, it was a journey into the unknown, and for me especially, because I'd never done stage before. Right. I mean, just the way that I, I got to this point in my career was I started as a radio presenter who got into comedy writing, who got into comedy acting, who got into acting. <coughs> And I'd, I'd never done, I'd, I'd done I'd, two very, very, very short things on stage. I even shied out of doing stand-up. I mean, the only thing I really did in a live context, I'd do a bit of after dinner speaking, and that's it. Yeah. So I'm like, I don't know what's going on. But it worked in my favour, because all the rest of the cast had done, they'd all done panto, they'd all done theatre, very experienced. I mean, Gab Mitchell has never stopped working all his professional life. But he was probably the most nervous, because he said... I know how the King's Theatre works. I know when you do a gag, the response you'll get. I know the dynamics of that. I know how to ride the laugh. I don't know what's going to happen in 11,000 Theatre. Yeah. I mean, well, for a start, will they laugh at all? Yeah. We're mic'd up, but do we play it out like we did Banto? Also, we've got massive screens, so do we play it like a telly performance mm. because we know we're going to get the big thing there? Yeah. Or do we still play it big? So they're having all these conversations and I'm like, oh, I'm like Scooby-Doo, right. oh, yeah. <laughs> let's just do it. Because yeah. I didn't have a frame of reference, it probably worked in my favour. Absolutely. But we didn't actually know until we did that first show of 2014, the day after the big vote, because <laughs> that was the weird <clears> thing as well, was that the way it happened. I mean, we sold out 21 shows and I think there's a lot of reasons for that. It was a lot of planets aligning for that to happen because obviously we were back after eight years and Ford and Greg had publicly fallen out and they were getting back together, so it was very much the Gary Barlow, Robbie Williams. Yeah, there was a lot of hype. Story, right? Yeah. Uh, but also, the Hydra was not, not, not long out of the packet. It was very much seen as Glasgow's venue and still game as Glasgow's sitcom. Yeah. Um, it was the day after the big vote. It was the year of the Commonwealth Games. I mean, it was just Glasgow's the place to be. So it was incredibly jammy. I mean, I'd, as, as much interest as there was in still game coming back, I think all those ingredients coming together added to it. Added to it. And, the sh- but we didn't know until that first show, the day after the big vote, how it would go. And we got standing ovation, and we got standing ovations every night uh, to the point where I was expecting it at home. And frankly, I wasn't getting it. Um, <laughs> but it was I. It was it was a uh, very gratifying, and, and and we'd always known how popular. It, it, you know, you get people shouting from white vans and building sites. You know, about when you're gonna knock those boys' heads together. When when you're gonna get yeah, back yeah. on telly and all that. I always knew, you know. That there was the show was popular, but to have that volume of people in one arena, is twenty one times, twenty one times, two Glastonbury. Did it get easier like, as the shows went on? So you done the first one was like extreme nerves, and then yeah. as you went through, this is actually getting yeah easier. It, it, yeah, it does. I mean, th- that's how theatre works anyway, which is which is which was news to me. I know, yeah. I, you know, cause I, like I said, not done it before, but it does get easier. And um, but then you start to expect stuff. I mean, thankfully we did get standing ovations every night, but we we're all thinking, oh, if you don't get one. Mm-hmm. We're going to be pure scarred. Yeah. Um, and then you start to normalise it as well because uh, I think we were six or seven shows in and it was an evening show. So we'd do the show, finished about, I don't know, 11 o'clock and then there'd always be like a wee after show thing um, at the Hydro where your pals that, that you invited would come along and have a drink mm-hmm. and all that bit of food. And then I'd go home. So I drove home and uh, so my wife was still up and... Uh, she was watching telly and she said, how did, how did it go tonight? I said, yeah, yeah, another standing ovation. Uh, I got milk for the morning. And she said, what, you went to, go, to get milk? I said, well, yeah, because the kids need <laughs> milk for cereal. I said, so you just, I mean, and, and bear in mind that I just had my Freddie Mercury moment. I've been doing my yeah. Bollywood dance routine. Yeah. Uh, she said, that's, that's, that's messed up, isn't it? I said, there's a wee bit, but 
to be honest with you, it's probably good that I don't. Otherwise, I might be out trying looking to score some coke or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably best that I go and get milk for the kids and yeah, get yeah. hauled back to earth. Yeah. Everyone says, you know, say to you, how how did the tour go? It wasn't a tour. It was a hydro. It was twelve minutes up the road from me. Yeah. yeah. So it was a, it was weird. It yeah. must have been weird. And I still now. I mean, it's, it feels surreal. <coughs> it's happened twice now, but it still feels odd. I mean, this genuinely happened. I was driving up the expressway past the hydro. And I jokingly said to everyone in the car, played that, mm-hmm. there was no one else in the car. I for- it was just me. I forgot it was just me. And I felt like such a dick. <laughs> but but the, thing, the thing was that I wasn't doing it to be arrogant. I was doing it almost to remind myself that that yeah, actually happened. Like that's mm-hmm. happened. But, you know, I've seen Prince there. I've seen Beyonce there. I've seen Jack White yeah, there. Yeah, of course. I was on that stage. I tell people I was in the same dressing room as Prince. I don't know. Yeah. But, you know... It's, the burden on them is to disprove that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See the the whole adrenaline thing. We touched on that before, and a lot of artists and musicians kind of once they're on that stage, they've got thousands of screaming fans in front of them. Then they go back to the hotel room and they're on their own. Yeah. And like that to cope with it, some time to drugs, drink. Yes. And if they're on their own, sitting in their bed with the telly on. Yeah. An hour before that, they were like. Yeah. The, Top I mean, of the world. That is that adrenaline rush. Is like a you know a heavy drug. Do you know what I mean? It's it's. It is oh, totally. weird. I mean, have you seen? How do you cope with it yourself? Well, the Glasgow mentality helps with that, right? Because this is the town will not let you. Do you know what I mean? Get this. This is why the C bomb is a compliment in this town, yeah. and I've, it's been said to me before. I was, my mate, my mate had done a fun run, and don't worry, I won't say the word, but we all know what the word is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my, my mate had done a fun run and we'd gone to a supporter and, and we were walking back from Glasgow Green there was a a jaked a refreshed couple shall we say uh, at the bus stop and she said there's that sea bomb off the telly uh-huh. and he goes aye he's a funny sea bomb <laughs> so it's almost like aye we like you but mm-hmm. we could stab you no but it's um, <laughs> I, I, I think it's a case of aye we'll temper it you know, you know mm-hmm. don't don't you don't know, get we, too big for your boots I, yeah. I kind of dad yeah, yeah. And that really helps, I think, with, right. with this stuff, you know, it, genuinely. Um, because, I, you know, I, I, I had a taste of that. I mean, as much as it was a sitcom on, on stage, I mean, I was, I was, it was like Freddie Mercury 21 times. Yeah. I mean, I had a thing where, uh, did you both see the show? I, I went to the show. Uh, I, I actually went. Well, so amazing. for anyone that doesn't, for anyone doesn't know, yeah. there's, there's this whole storyline where uh, I just made uh, mushroom soup. Yeah. Mushroom, she's picked up herself. Uh-huh. So she has this psychedelic sequence at the end. Uh, and I get wheeled on in full Bollywood outfit with dancers uh-huh. on the stairs. So what happens is, is that I, excellent dancing. Yeah. yeah, and the scene, the scene directly before that is, is that the big thing in the in the bar where they're doing the the, the, the wedding, the, the vows yeah. on the iPad. So I've left that scene. I've got thirty second costume change. Two people helping me. I get in the Bollywood outfit, and then I get wheeled out like this. So what it means is. So what I see, and I'm the only person in the world that gets this view, is 10,000 people going like that. What? Because <laughs> they think, well, I know mushrooms, but this? <laughs> so I'm getting that. And it sweeps across. So I'm seeing this. I remember once I was going out thinking, this could very easily go to your head if you let mm-hmm. it. Yeah. You know? And you just don't. You just have to. But then again, it's not like being in Aerosmith where you go backstage and there's people throwing drugs at you. You yeah. know what I mean? There's quite a large security thing. guard giving you a can yeah. of Fanta. So, yeah, <laughs> aye, aye. It's, it's a different, different, different level. Thing. Aye. Um, but so it's a taste of it. It is a taste of it. And, you know, I mean, we all need validated. It doesn't matter. What's interesting as well is, is that, I mean, I'm, I like all different kinds of comedy. I like, you know, like we were talking about music before. You know, people say, I like music with a good, I like music that's good. What does that mean? But I do like broad comedy that's good. There's also a lot of broad comedy that's rubbish. I like really, really dark, obscure comedy. Some of that's rubbish as well. Mm-hmm. But I'm a big fan of like Chris Morris and that kind of thing and uh, the stuff that Amanda Nucci does and The Mighty Bush and that sort of stuff which you could describe as more obscure and culty. Yeah. And I guess I possibly thought that I would prefer to end up in that, at that level. Mm-hmm. But what I worked out was, was that actually, do you know what? If people like what you do, they like what you do. Yeah. Where there's broad, where it's not. So to get that kind of validation, I think I think we all crave it, and we're all creators. I mean, I think it's not 
it's not about the adulation, it's about the fact that your work touched somebody. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's yeah. it. It's yeah. not about the celebrity or the fame, it's actually just about what got you there. If it helps someone, you know, if it takes, I mean, everyone relates it back to their own sort mm. of journey. Their own you know, experience, yeah. Whatever it is, but... End of part one. Magic arm. Yes, the one. magic arm. The, ma- the, ma- the man with the magic arm. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're not meant to say that, but, you know, Finn's a great guy, so we're just going to put him in it anyway. Hey, guys, so that's part one so far with Sanjeev Kali. We've went, I've really, really been enjoying that. Um, yeah, Escapade so. show number nine, where we get very interesting people on the show to talk about their careers and hopefully help you guys out with whatever you're doing. We'll be back for part two very soon. Bye.